uh, when Charlie Cole uh, said that he would be out of the state today after he was asked to uh, uh, make this introduction. He asked me if I would be happy to, to do that. And I said that um, and nothing would give me greater pleasure than to introduce the mayor of the city of Baltimore to uh, this gathering. But I said, Charlie, this is like introducing somebody that needs no introduction. What am I supposed to say? You all know the, what it's all about. I thought it might be interesting, uh, rather than to discuss uh, all the current achievements that the mayor has accomplished, that I might review some of the, very briefly, past achievements of our good mayor. And maybe all of you remember that uh, Mayor Schmoke grew up and attended public schools in Baltimore. He graduated from, with honors from Baltimore City College High School and won the award as a top scholar athlete in the city and no mean lacrosse player. He went on to receive his Bachelor of Arts degree from Yale University. He studied at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar and I understand I was just briefed by one of his colleagues that uh, here at this time he did extensive traveling uh, in Eastern Europe and Western Europe, the Middle East, and South America. In 1976, he went on to earn his law degree at Harvard University. Really, truly remarkable. He began his law practice with the local Baltimore firm of Piper and Marbury, and shortly afterwards, was appointed by President Carter as a member of the White House domestic policy staff. I hope that you're just not now hearing me when I get into this. In 1978, Mayor Smoke returned to Baltimore as an assistant U.S. attorney. He later, later returned to private practice. And in 1982, the mayor was elected state's attorney for Baltimore City. Kurt L. Smoke was inaugurated mayor of the city that reads on December 8, 1987. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to introduce Kurt L. Smoke. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, very much. I'm indeed honored to be asked to speak tonight I appreciate the uh, fact, and I, I don't know whether it is symbolic that Carol would decide to talk about past achievement, um, because I know that since um, April of last year when I addressed the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Washington on the subject of, of narcotics uh, policy, there have been many people who simply introduced me as that young man who had a bright future. Well, I uh, look forward with uh, great optimism to the future, not only for myself and my family, but uh, clearly for the city of Baltimore. And I have to tell you that I am uh, feeling very, very good about the, the city these days. I was really honored on behalf of all of you to have Mrs. Bush here yesterday to visit the uh, Learning Bank and to see some of our adult literacy programs and to talk about other things that are going on in the city. She uh, was a very, is a very strong proponent of family literacy programs, and uh, we had, she, she was only here for an hour, but uh, I think that she touched the lives of a lot of people. Unfortunately, I have to tell you, as these things occur, the thing that actually got most news out of that visit had nothing to do with the city that reads. It had nothing to do with literacy programs. It had everything to do with her and her family, and particularly her little dog, Millie. After going through all the uh, wonderful programs at the Learning Bank and seeing computer-assisted learning and all of that, a reporter decided to ask Mrs. Bush about an article, which many of you may have seen. It's in the, the cover of Life magazine. On the cover, cover of Life magazine for this month is Barbara Bush, with her dog and all those little puppies. The question, Mrs. Bush, I hear that Millie likes to take showers. Mrs. Bush's response, indeed so. But in fact, we have a problem. Millie is so short that she can't reach the nozzles herself. So a certain high elected official of our country 
who shall go nameless, takes the dog into the shower. And let me go further to say that often he showers with the dog. What this means for our president and his image abroad, I don't know. But Mrs. Bush left for saying that she hopes that uh, that high elected official is not now sore at her. But that was the news that hit the wire service. Uh, at least it had the byline of Baltimore. We are pleased uh, to get the, uh, the attention. But I wanted to uh, talk this, this evening uh, briefly uh, about Baltimore as an international city, a city with economic, social, and cultural ties to other cities and other countries around the world. But our emergence as an international city begins not over there, but here with the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs and the general willingness of the people of Baltimore to look beyond our shores or to get to the very heart of the matter beyond our harbor. The industries at the outer edge of our harbor are not the outer edge of our economy. To think otherwise is to stand with those who watched Columbus inch toward the horizon in 1492, fully expecting him not just to fall from grace, but to fall from sight. Fortunately, Columbus had more imagination, courage, and foresight than his critics. And his one big idea led to countless smaller ones. Still, the need for new thinking is as important today as it was 500 years ago. And that, the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs has plainly recognized. I know that the Council has heard from many speakers on a wide variety of issues related to world economics, world politics, and that goal which all of us so fervently seek, world peace. But this evening, I'd like to bring foreign affairs closer to home. I want to show that traffic on the Chesapeake runs in two directions and across two oceans. It's not just goods that are going back and forth. Goodwill is, too. And so are ideas, culture, people, and most important, destinies. Shakespeare didn't suddenly get it wrong. Our fate is still in ourselves, not in our stars. But we have to rethink what we mean when we say ourselves. We share a destiny, not just with other people in this city, or this region for that matter, but with the world at large. Baltimore is looking at Italy, Spain, Soviet Union, Canada, England, and many other places, and they are looking back at us. Our entry into the global economy means change and readjustment. It also means opportunity. The world isn't getting flatter, that's for sure, but it is getting smaller smaller, more interdependent, more mobile, and more aware than ever that going it alone can mean going over the edge. Well, at the risk of giving the kind of false impression that my foreign contacts and experiences since becoming mayor are themselves what has uh, made Baltimore an international city, I do want to talk today about those contacts and experiences. I'm going to do that with two caveats. The first is that my responsibility as mayor has been to respond to the reality of an international marketplace and to help Baltimore's businesses and cultural communities enter that marketplace. The second is that my focus of attention this evening barely begins to cover the wide variety of international relationships, many that don't involve the public sector that exist between people of Baltimore and other countries. There are, for example, very strong ties between Baltimore's Jewish communities and, and Israel. I had the pleasure of traveling to Israel last year with members of the Associated Jewish Charities to look at Project Renewal sites, the program of housing rehabilitation that we are going to try to implement here. In the same vein, there's an ongoing historical relationship between Baltimore's African-American community and the country of Liberia. In business and academia, the story is the same. Johns Hopkins is in Bologna and China. The University of Maryland is in West Germany and other countries. USF&G has had business around the world. And of course, the Baltimore-Washington International Airport handles international traffic. Student exchanges have become commonplace. Just last week, I met with a group of students from Odessa, and I could keep going on. But, but let me go back to the, the program 
that has really energized our coming of age as an international city, and that is Baltimore's very active and sustained sister city program. We have sister cities throughout Europe, in the Soviet Union, Africa, and Asia. Last fall, I visited a number of our European sister cities. I'm not going to recite for you a travel log, but I want to talk about two important themes, both tied into 1992 that we discuss with our friends in Europe. And the first was our proposal to the Commission of the European Communities to hold a, a trade and cultural exposition in Baltimore in 1992. This was done in conjunction with uh, the uh, state of Maryland. That is the year that the people uh, all over the world will be celebrating Columbus's uh, voyage to the New World. But in 1992, the old world is heading for something almost as new and startling as what Columbus found. It is scheduled to become one market, a united Europe. So while we were in Brussels, we suggested to the members of the European communities that they come to Baltimore to promote themselves and to explain what this new economic relationship among European countries will mean for the United States and the rest of the world. The EC was uh, very intrigued with our idea because they recognized the importance of building bridges to other countries, especially when they're talking about creating a market large enough to compete with the United States and Japan. That frightens European, Europe's trade partners. But in every challenge, there is an opportunity. And that is certainly the case for Baltimore. We can be the stage upon which the rest of the United States gets its first close look at Europe without borders. I hope that the EC will bring the trade and cultural exposition to Baltimore. I can't say at this point that they will, although I can say that we made a very strong case. But even if the European communities decide against the exposition, the trip to Brussels was nevertheless worth the effort. We heighten the awareness of Europeans about Baltimore. They now know that Baltimore and Washington together anchor the fourth largest market in the United States, and they better recognize the importance of having the people of this region learn about both the United Europe of 1992 and the individual countries that will make up that genuinely common market. Well, where do things stand now? We're continuing to negotiate. And we're continuing to offer specific countries the opportunity to come to Baltimore to promote themselves, even without the trade and cultural exposition. But the process, the process is as important as the goal. By talking about Baltimore with the international community, by letting them know about our purchasing power, our port facilities, our educational and cultural institutions, our easy access to other parts of the East Coast by air, sea, or land, our broad ethnic ties to countries throughout Europe, and our genuine desire to do business, we become players in the international marketplace, which is no longer a luxury. It is now a necessity. 1992 is not only the year, year when the old world becomes new, it's the year when the new world remembers the old. As part of our Columbus 500 celebration, Baltimore will be hosting visitors from around the world. We will also be sponsoring numerous events, including an international yacht race. But what I would most like to see celebrated in 1992 here in Baltimore in honor of Christopher Columbus is brain power. Brain power is now the city's most important resource. Bethlehem Steel used to be our largest private employer. Today, Johns Hopkins University is. The mines are here, and clearly they are a terrible thing to waste. That is why I continue to emphasize the importance of education and reading. Business needs smart workers, and with a properly funded public education system, we can give business the workers they need, either directly from high school or after further training in college or other higher education. Those workers, in turn, will enable Baltimore to not just survive in the international marketplace, but to aggressively profit from that marketplace. I should add that in 1992, we don't just want to celebrate discovery. We want to learn from it. 
And that's why we're setting up educational enrichment programs to help children better understand the global marketplace. We also want children to understand who came to this country and why, and the fact that immigration has given us such a rich and diverse culture. In 500 years, we've learned some painful lessons about the need for different races and ethnic groups to learn to live together. These are lessons we can share with our European friends as their borders become easier to cross and the wave of immigration to Europe from Asia, Africa, and the subcontinent continues. Well, so far I've been talking about themes and ideas, but Baltimore as an international city is not merely a hope or prediction for our future. Our business community is deeply involved in European commerce. And I'd like to give you one specific example, not so much because of the deal itself, but because it illustrates the role city government can play in helping our industry serve business abroad. Gentlemen who traveled on our, our trip uh, to Europe and our sister cities, a man named Ed Hale. Ed Hale, some of you know, owns a Hale container and Port East Transfer. He had been negotiating a contract with Italian Lines to have his company handle some of their cargo here. Ed and his colleagues had already laid most of the important groundwork running the numbers for Italian Lines. But when I was in Genoa, I talked to the head of Italian Lines along with Mr. Hale, not as a, an expert on container ships, but as a partner with Baltimore's private sector. And we were able to see that multi-million dollar contract signed which is not only good for Ed Hale and Hale Container, it's good for the Port of Baltimore and for all the people of Baltimore. One of the reasons we were able to get that contract signed is because in Europe the relationship between government and industry is much closer than it is in the United States. European business persons who are themselves used to acting in concert with their governments like the added reassurance of doing business in a public-private partnership. So I see my role as being a partner and a strong advocate for Baltimore's business community. European business leaders need to know that Baltimore business has the support of Baltimore city government, including our city council. I want our business community to succeed, and I am committed to helping make sure that they do. I've been calling ours an, an international city not only because of our efforts to showcase Baltimore to the international community and to sell it abroad, which is done in part through the city's new Office of International Programs, but because to a great extent, as we all know, Europe and Asia are already here. Look at the, the local ownership interests now. We have many uh, companies that are involved deeply with our foreign partners, Pompeii Oil Company, owned by the Spanish concerns, Lock Insulator at Port Covington by the Japanese, Merck Shipping, the largest shipping company in Baltimore by the Danish, and Evergreen, the second largest by the Taiwanese, First National Bank in their relationship with the Irish Bank, and Monumental Life Insurance Company is owned by a Dutch corporation. Are these foreign ownership interests harmful? No, no indeed. But they are Ill illustrative of how Baltimore is being drawn into global competition. And I'm pleased that international business recognizes opportunities in Baltimore. Those opportunities mean capital and jobs and expanding tax base, cross-cultural contacts, tourism, and growth. Outside ownership is not a threat. It's simply a fact of the international marketplace that we should be taking advantage of. In fact, we already are. Foreign business leaders here in Baltimore have helped both me and local businesses. For example, while I was in Madrid, Juan March, the major stockholder in Signet Bank, helped arrange for us to brief the Confederation of Spanish Business Entrepreneurs about why they should do business in Baltimore. And First National Bank provided a loan to the Culinary Arts Institute so they could set up a school in Dublin. We are building important relationships with members of the international business community, and these relationships are paying dividends. Well, I can't talk uh, about uh, Baltimore as an international city without mentioning my recent lunch with Prince Charles. 
And let, let me uh, make two quick points about this because I, I was told that should leave um, some time for, uh, for questions. And I really don't normally like to give uh, speeches. Every time I get up to, to, to give a speech, I'm haunted by the reminder of a, a friend of mine who said, Kurt, you must remember that a speech in order to be immortal need not be eternal. Uh, but let me uh, make a couple points about my lunch with, uh, with Prince Charles. The, the first is that uh, I was extremely gratified by the response of people in Baltimore to my being invited uh, to that lunch, and I received a lot of letters praising Prince Charles uh, for his recognition of Baltimore, and I uh, uh, commented to His Royal Highness about that. I mean, he knew a great deal about the city, and I was uh, pleased uh, at that, and uh, I thought that was quite an honor. The second point has to do, though, with the, the substance of what was discussed there. As I, I think you know, there were about 20 guests, and we began by each focusing on fairly narrow uh, perspectives and issues that apparently we had been invited to discuss. But as the conversation progressed, the substance of what we were all saying converged. It became uh, quickly apparent that there's no separating urban unemployment and air and water pollution and drug abuse and homelessness and so on. All these issues are really interrelated. And moreover, they're all interrelated on a global scale. As Senator Gore, who was there, has pointed out, environmental damage in Antarctica is being felt around the world. As I said, the world is indeed getting smaller. And that point was made clearly through that, that luncheon. Let me conclude by, by simply saying that, uh, as all of you really understand, Baltimore is an international city. And we're going to become more so in the future. The city is developing a strategy that will make the most of our international trading relationships. We're doing that in partnership, not just with business, but with the state and other jurisdictions in this region. We need to work with the District of Columbia government, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Europe is now uh, learning an important lesson that uh, I think we learned uh, more than 200 years ago. We gave Congress the exclusive right to regulate interstate commerce. We decided that our prosperity could best be assured by not allowing commercial barriers between states. In 1992, Europe is going to try that same stroke of genius. So now we have to do more. We have to plan as a region how we are going to position ourselves in the global marketplace. That means working together to protect our environment, build transportation systems, share educational resources, and market this market. The old world is about to remake itself, and we have to be ready to do the same. The question is, with respect to your concept of Baltimore as an international city, uh, would you comment upon the relationship of Baltimore and the surrounding five counties? Yes, there, there, there are times when, uh, I guess to paraphrase a famous uh, gentleman, when I uh, look towards my friends in Baltimore County and say we, we, we are political jurisdictions divided by a common language, um, I, uh, th there's more interaction uh, today uh, than there's been in the uh, past uh, few years. Um, I think that it is, it is difficult to move that along when people in the county look into the city and see that $6 property tax rate and, and other uh, things. But we have agreed on some of these issues that I talked about. Transportation, for example, is an issue of common concern. And we came together through the Regional Planning Council to develop a strategy on transportation for the region. There are other areas. I think our cultural institutions that we are going to see more and more cooperation um, in environmental concerns. But there are some other issues that it's very difficult to deal with because of the local politics. But I think in marketing ourselves abroad, there is a common interest uh, there 
uh, there's a working relationship. Uh, many people involved in our sister cities program, in fact, live in the counties. Um, so we, we, but we still see that interest in the area. This year, I went to, uh, I'm sorry, in December, I went to London for the International Tourism uh, Conference and Baltimore, along with um, Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C., had a joint uh, exhibit. We, uh, <clears throat> with a little bit of license, marketed ourselves as George Washington country. Um, Virginia chose not to participate. Uh, <laughs> but we did that um, and received a very good response um, uh, from that effort. So I, I think that in terms of our marketing efforts internationally, we can, that's an area where we will have a great deal of uh, regional cooperation. Well, I can't give you the uh, specific numbers. I see uh, 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 Randy Evans here could probably do a little bit better on the, what it means to the state, but I can tell you that tourism is clearly one of Baltimore's leading industries. To the extent we expect to uh, receive millions of guests in 1992, that's what we're preparing for with this Columbus 500 uh, celebration. We believe that throughout the year we will have a, a, a large number of events that will attract uh, millions of visitors. Right now, um, our the tourism industry does produce. Uh, uh, a lot of money for this community. The specific uh, dollars I can't give you, but I can tell you that it's one of the largest in industries in, uh, in Baltimore City. I think we'll do much better over the next uh, few years. Uh, more and more people are beginning, as they look at Washington, D.C., to look at Baltimore as the place to come stay, and then day trip to Washington, uh, D.C. Um, <clears throat> clearly, we are promoting that as a, a way of uh, seeing uh, the, the region. Um, so I, I do think that, yes, tourism will play a larger and larger role. The uh, precise dollar amount is hard to gauge at this time. The, uh, the question is, in the international context, is as a little bit um, how would you simply deal with an increased drug problem? Well, let, let me first uh, respond to the uh, comment. Uh, the, the head of the Guardian Angels has referred to me as the Pee Wee Herman of the war on drugs. Um, and I really am not sure whether he was complimenting me or criticizing me. I, uh, but clearly he and I have a different point of view. I just uh, briefly mentioned that today, that finally, the Guardian Angels did meet with our police department and agreed uh, to alter their tactics so that they would focus primarily on community organization and getting others involved in being the eyes and ears of their community and not on their so-called uh, citizen arrest tactics. They said that would be a last resort. Um, on, the, on the international issue, we did talk about uh, that briefly at the luncheon with um, uh, Prince Charles. Everybody is, is obviously concerned about this matter. Uh, we did not spend a great deal of time on the issue of decriminalization um, uh, because there were some other issues that he wanted to, to go into, and I, I didn't raise um, uh, the issue uh, that day. I have spoken uh, just a couple of weeks ago to the drug czar, Mr. Bennett, about his initial proposals for Washington, D.C., and as you may know, he has now dramatically changed uh, the ideas that he initially had. He, he initially wanted to put a lot of new heavy resources into Washington, including National Guard and, and other types of resources. And all that I wanted to say to him was that there is a very recent history that you should not ignore. And that history was at the beginning of the Reagan administration, the president wanted to clean up the drug problem in South Florida and created the South Florida Task Force. And they put in massive resources, including the AWACS planes and, and the FBI that traditionally was not involved in drug trafficking. And he poured all of those resources um, coordinated by the vice president into South Florida. And the result after eight years, of course, was more drug trafficking 
in South Florida, and the government had to create 13 new regional organized drug strike forces to deal with the spread of drug trafficking across the Gulf uh, states and, and the Gulf Coast states. And, and so there was a very recent uh, experience with trying to deal with this problem in the massive uh, law enforcement uh, method. And I just wanted to bring that to uh, the attention of Mr. Bennett. Uh, now, um, I do not know what kind of program he's going to do. The only thing that he's talked about concretely is the need to build a 500-bed uh, jail. He wants to have a, a, a pretrial facility. Why that is important to him, I do not know, because last year, Chief Turner in Washington arrested 43,000 people, which means that if you build that facility, it'll be overcrowded in less than two weeks. Um, and with not uh, any impact on the problem. What we are doing, though, is trying to get ahead of, of the, uh, the problem, the crack problem. We, we have in Baltimore about 30,000 opiate addicts. We know that. Um, and we only have treatment slots for 3,200. Uh, on the law enforcement side, we have a regional task force that was created about four years ago. It works very well with uh, law enforcement agencies around uh, the state and in this region. We are beginning now, however, to see the beginning of, of the, the uh, crack problem. Uh, it's trying to nose its way uh, in here. And uh, the, the law enforcement officials have been uh, very aggressive, but I think what has helped Baltimore more than anything else is that in a city of 750,000 people, we have 105,000 citizens signed up in neighborhood block watch programs. That, that really helps a great deal to, to get the police targeted on certain areas rather than generalize their patrols. With all these people calling in using the citizens uh, hotline and things of that nature, it helps us target our resources. And I think that's allowed us to, to do a, a little bit better job on the law enforcement. But I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, and, and I, I hope that, that uh, I have not, um, somebody said I've embarrassed my city uh, through um, my discussion of decriminalization, but I, I hope you don't uh, uh, feel embarrassed by, by what I'm doing. All that I'm trying to do in raising this issue is to say that we've got to stop and think through what is the rationale for our policy, who's really winning and who's losing in this war on drugs. We have had drug prohibition now since 1914. And as I look out, I see a strategy that is not only failed, but it can't be made to win. That is, every time we pour in these heavy law enforcement resources, we inflate the risk, which drives up the price, which brings more people in trafficking and more profits to drug dealers. So I look out at Baltimore City and, I, and, and the state of Maryland, and I say 75 years after the war on drugs, what do we have? We've got a community with a large number of people incarcerated, people scared uh, because of drug crime. We have got now an uh, enormous number of uh, people involved with AIDS because of the sharing of intravenous uh, needles. I don't think that uh, that is a success story. And Washington's problems are not because Marion Barry is not a good mayor. Washington's problems is that we have a national drug policy that is a failure, and nobody is willing to sit down and try to correct it. So I, I just hope that the, the drug czar will go through some of this uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis, will look at uh, the use of the AWACS planes and see that we've only arrested 10 people by using the AWACS planes for eight years, and could that money have been better spent on other drug pre abuse prevention and education programs? And just think through, think through why is it that we have a substance that the Surgeon General says is the most addictive substance that kills 350,000 people a year and is not classified as a drug. It's called nicotine. We, and we, that's legal, we promote its sale and we subsidize it. More people have died in one year of ingesting cigarettes 
than have died in the last 20 years of ingesting marijuana. And, and we just ask, wh why? And I don't think anybody has even sat down rationally and just said, why? And that, that is really the thrust of what I'm trying to do, is to create a public health war. I want a war on drugs that's a public health war, but I want the war on drugs to be led by the Surgeon General, not the Attorney General. And I hope the country soon begins to make a, a change in its philosophy. Yep. The, uh, the question was, is the international drug problem the problem of a cartel which would carry with it negative economic consequences? Well, yeah, we are hearing that more and more, and that unfortunately makes us indirectly we become co-conspirators in this. That is, if, if we know that a foreign government, an ally, is involved in drug trafficking, and yet we choose not to do anything about it because he's an ally, you know, how, how can we then turn to the domestic community and say to our kids, just say no? I mean, our, our whole foreign policy now is getting completely screwed up by uh, this, this drug problem. International banking becomes involved in the problem. If you have loans to a country like Colombia, uh, deep and significant loans, do you turn your back knowing how they're paying off those loans? Well, all that I'm saying, yes, all that I'm saying is that we, this is how the whole, the money behind the drug business gets our, our foreign policy terribly complicated. When I, let me just give you a quick example. I was in Israel, and we went up uh, to the northern borders, and all that the uh, people in the kibbutzim could talk about was the fact that uh, the uh, Bekaa Valley was, was not just controlled by their enemies, but also happened to be a place for growing hashish. That that, that was a big issue in question. Are terrorist groups getting financed by uh, this kind of drug, uh, drug sale. So it, it gets just incredibly uh, uh, complicated. I'm just looking at it from the standpoint domestically. I'm trying to take the profits out of these guys, and that's why I want to uh, pull the addicts into the public health system and away from the clutches of, of these, uh, these crooks. But, but I, I didn't want to spend all my time uh, talking about that, but it's, it, it clearly gets into the international arena uh, very, very quickly. The uh, question is, does the block location send a negative signal to the rest of the country and the world? And the world, what have we done? Uh, well, from the um, reaction, I think you stepped on a few toes now, Joe. I, um, as you know, the, the block is shrinking. Um, it is now down to about three quarters of a block. Um, with the police department at one end, our major financial institutions, we've just moved a, a public building. I do think that uh, the block uh, will be fading. Uh, it is an idea whose time has uh, come and gone. Um, but I uh, don't think you'll see it completely eliminated uh, quickly. There, there are an awful lot of veterans that love to come back to Baltimore, and they always walk down Baltimore Street and say, I remember when. But I, I don't think that we're sent, if we were promoting as a, a, a local government, promoting that as a particularly a point for people to come see, I think we, I'd have more concern. But I, as a government, we, we don't promote the activity on the block. I, I don't, and I don't promote its uh, activity. Yes. Okay. Oh, kidding. Why won't the taxpayers let you take that on the <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, we, as you may know, we are working on that. Uh, Lee Tawney is uh, the head of our inter Office of International Programs, is working very hard with the members of our sister cities program to put together uh, this uh, trip. I am a little bit uh, concerned right now about the, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, um, portion of that trip. Uh, last that I heard, Mayor Ito uh, was, was very ill, and, and I, I don't know whether the, the city or the um, local elected officials there are up for 
hosting this type of um, a mission at, at this time. But uh, we're looking towards trying to have this trip. Yes, we will have uh, uh, people on the trip who can speak uh, the language. Um, I don't, I really don't think on this particular trip we'll be able to go to Singapore. I've been to Singapore. Um, it, was, it was quite a while ago now. It was the summer of 1970, in fact, was, was when I was there. And I know that the, a lot of things have, have changed uh, since then. Uh, we do have interest, financial interest from Singapore interested in Baltimore uh, now, as many of you know. So we hope that, uh, to develop uh, greater ties there, and, w and we do intend in the trips that we take to have um, uh, those who can speak the language to, to join the trip. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Question, I believe, is, uh, does the city have any specific uh, programs to encourage training in the Caribbean without the Caribbean South Yeah. Well, the, the, the city itself, as I mentioned before, we do have an Office of International Programs. It was just established uh, about a year ago. We do not have, well, working through the State Department of Economic and Employment Development, they are the ones that have really taken the lead in terms of encouraging business and providing, um, uh, providing uh, some incentives and assistance uh, to business. That's why I keep referring to Secretary Evans over there. They, the city, I mean, the state just recently had a program uh, in which the governor was speaking there to define uh, for the business community some of the efforts that the State Department of Economic Employment Development uh, will offer them. Uh, with respect to the Caribbean, I had this weekend, though, a meeting with the uh, Jamaican uh, Association of Maryland to talk more about the development of uh, greater ties, at least uh, to Jamaica, because of our large Jamaican uh, community that we have here. We've extended an offer to Mr. Manley uh, on his many trips uh, to the United States to uh, come to Baltimore. And uh, I will be, I've accepted a, a trip, not uh, again in the Caribbean, but to Africa, to go to Liberia in 1990. Uh, the reason for that is that the African Methodist Episcopal Church will be celebrating its 100th anniversary, their involvement uh, with Liberia, and the bishop for that area was a minister uh, of an AME church here in Baltimore, uh, Reverend John Bryant, now Bishop uh, John Bryant, and uh, he's extended that invitation, and I intend to uh, follow up on that and hopefully try to uh, uh, do some some other business while we're over there. But it's primarily the State Department of Economic and Employment uh, Development that has taken the lead, and we have just joined with them. Why more than not making visits to foreigners more convenient for all? Yeah, um, I'm glad you raised that, because when we went on our trip to Europe, um, that was one of the things that I asked, and again, Lee Tawney is here. When we got to various countries, we saw what we needed as soon as we uh, got there. And the question that I asked was, can we uh, offer these same services to people coming uh, into Baltimore? Now, clearly we can if they come into New York or uh, Atlanta and some places, but we haven't been able to offer those services. What we are intend to do is go to our private business community and say, look, here's the, the, the contacts that we are having. They are increasing we would like to be able to offer these particular services. The money exchange is a big issue. Um, I can talk to Mr. Jackson about that in a, few, a little while, but that is, we're, we're going to go back to the uh, business community and explain those services that we've seen abroad and how we can improve them here in Baltimore. But that's one of the, the goals of our Office of International Programs. Well, as I said, first of all, as I mentioned, we, we hope that they accept our invitation to host this um, cultural and economic exposition here so that, that Europe can explain to the United States what it expects from itself. What I gathered in our conversations was that they are still explaining a lot to one another um, and uh, that there are an awful lot of issues that haven't been resolved and may not be resolved in terms of the economic issues prior to 1992. So I, I see that once the, uh, the United Europe becomes a fact, we will have a new large economic competitor. But the competition, I think, will be healthy and it will be uh, good for our, our city. Is there any way for the city to have an impact upon 
home education, especially <clears throat> Well, that, if, if I knew the quick answer to that one, uh, we, are, we are struggling with that. You know, in this proposed budget, which will be the largest uh, increase that the city has ever, ever given to education, we're still falling way short of a lot of the priorities that have been set for the school system. So I asked Dr. Hunter to pick out those things that um, were, that, that he could, could fund and could move on. Uh, next academic year, and he came up with two in issues in particular. One was school security, which we've had some concern with, and the second was parent involvement. So uh, he sees that as a priority. What the nature of the parent involvement program will look like, I can't tell you now, but that is a major priority for us. That is one of the reasons behind our literacy effort, that we recognize that one of the best ways for a child to learn how to read is for someone to read to that child, and yet we're finding a number of our adults, our parents, who are functionally illiterate. So we're trying to uh, open up uh, uh, more um, uh, avenues for them to learn how to read, and, and you will see the result of that. We're going to have a lot of neighborhood learning centers. As you know, uh, Cal Ripken gave us some money to open up uh, the Cal and Kelly Ripken Lifelong Learning Center. So we're going to do a heavy focus on uh, raising the levels of literacy for adults, and hopefully that will have a, a benefit in the home. I've made some proposals to Dr. Hunter for the parent involvement effort. The BUILD organization is very involved with uh, parent involvement. Mrs. MacArthur, who's one of our new school board members, got a national award for a parent program that she created at Edgewood Elementary School. So we've got the uh, resources now mobilized, and hopefully with all that energy, we'll see more parents involved in the education of their children in the home. Well, unfortunately, that, that's one where you, you've got the jurisdiction problem. We don't do any, we don't control the port. Um, the, the latest efforts that the state made, however, to settle the labor issues around the port are going to send a very strong signal about the uh, efficiency and profitability of doing business in the port of Baltimore, and I think that's very important. On the manufacturing side, again, I have to defer to Secretary Evans over there because it's the state that has been most involved. We have set up some small zones, manufacturing zones, for small business, small business involved in the manufacturing sector. The Canton Trade Center is one that I can talk about. We've just uh, decided to set aside the area. If you go down Boston Street past Tendeco and all those areas, you get to Clinton Street. We have designated that now an, uh, an industrial area, so we won't condoize um, all that industrial area to help uh, port-related industry. So we are very consciously trying to keep land set aside for industrial uses, um, but generally it has been the state that has been primarily involved in marketing our, our manu uh, manufacturing sector. And they clearly are the ones, the Port Admi uh, Commission Administration is involved in running uh, the Port of Baltimore. How does your experience in the job compare with your expectations? Nothing in life prepares you to be a mayor <laughs> of a big city. Um, I, fortunately, at that time as state's attorney, I knew, you know, some of the problems. Um, but this has been a full court press. Uh, it is, uh, there have been days when I worried, however, that my children would think of me as a figment of their imagination. So we, we've had to really wrestle to control the, um, uh, to control the schedule, but I am, not because I'm standing before you and trying to, to boost the city, but I'm genuinely optimistic about the future of Baltimore. I'm real proud of the city, obviously, uh, you know, having grown up here and been educated here and uh, gone on that one blind date here and then married the lady. I mean, that was, you know, all a part of, uh, of my experience, but I just see uh, that uh, we, we have a base here to build on uh, that we're stronger than many other uh, American cities, um, that if we can uh, work together and continue that, that sense of optimism and that real can-do spirit, in, which I believe, and 
people will debate me on this, but I think that the, the legacy that, that the governor, as the, our former mayor, that, that more than anything else, his, his legacy w was just instilling in us a, a sense that we can solve problems, a, a kind of a, a, a spirit, a, a can-do spirit. And now we're just got to solve the problems in the human services areas and, and, and make ourselves a stronger community for the future. And I believe that if we can do that, and we will do that, that Baltimore is going to be a, a one of the, the great cities, not only of this country, but one of the great cities of the world as we move into 2000.